Okay. This for a full of the folly of Tony Israel and continuing with the uh, concept of fair and good. Okay, it's so something here called sorry, keep on the look called uh, Shuma Hadar S U H M A Hadar as in H A D A R. Another halakh manifestation of the requirement to do what is fair and good is, is called Shuma Hada. This ruling deals with the case of a person who borrowed money and could not repay his loan, in which case the court appropriates some of his assets, valued at the full amount of the loan, and transfers them to the lender. If the transferred assets were real estate, i.e. land or buildings, the borrower can later reclaim his property in exchange for repaying the loan. The sages took into consideration the financial and emotional distress of a borrower who has had his land and home foreclosed and ruled that the, that the mitzvah to do so, to do what is fair and good dictates that the borrower can at any time retrieve his property if he repays the loan in cash. And this is from Baba Matsya, actually, 35A. This option can be exercised only if the lender had not sold the real estate and or the value or, or condition of the transferred assets have not changed. Okay. There's another thing here beyond the letter of the law, but I'll do that uh, tomorrow because it's uh, taken a couple, a couple of extra minutes. I'll rather do that tomorrow. So just to recap, so what does it say here? Um, as long as, as uh, the main thing is, as long as that property uh, wasn't sold by the, um, is it here? Um, the, the, the lender. Okay. It says this option can, can be, let's repeat it. This option can be exercised only if the lender had not sold the real estate and the value or condition of the transfer. So that, that, that property will actually belong to the borrower. And so the lender could have actually, in his right, he could have sold it. Doesn't say anything, it didn't say it was illegal. Time. All right, so guys, we went through 10 stipulated conditions that Yeshua gave to uh, Klau Yisrael in the land of Eris Yisrael in order to a merit living in the land of Israel and continue to live in the land of Eris Yisrael. So we're going to deal with um, a couple of residual issues. The first one being an inconsistency regarding the actual conditions listed. Because we said that there were 10 conditions listed and they're actually 11 in number. So the Gemara resolves the difficulty. In truth, uh, King Shlomo, King Solomon authored the condition. They may walk along the permissible paths until the second autumnal rainfall. So what did we say autumnal is? It's a fancy word to say that in autumn there rains in Eretz Israel. In South Africa, the rains are in spring and summer. But in Israel, they in um, autumn simply because uh, it's a Mediterranean climate. Okay? And that condition was added to the list because there are so many other wayfaring stipulations there that we thought unless we add this uh, part of King Solomon, then at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, uh, there's going to be certain parts missing. And it's like that which was taught in a Brysa. Consider the case where one's crop has disappeared from the field. In other words, when can a crop disappear from the field? Not when it's stolen. It's not South Africa. When the guy harvested them. So it says, and yet he does not allow people to enter into his field to take a shortcut. So what do people say about this sort of guy? They say, what benefit does so-and-so have from denying us access? And how do the people damage him when they've traversed his barren field? So if you're looking at such an unbenevolent person, uh, it says in the Chumash, when can you be good? Do not be called bad, which I think is an amazing expression. Okay, And basically, it's an epigram. If you look at Gamora Brochus in the 30th Duff, um, it, it will say, listen, you want to know the first way to be good? Stop doing bad. I mean, if you look at it, guys, the interesting thing is somebody in a coma creates less of virus than I do. 
That's one way to look at it. So, uh, so that's the first thing and why it's saying it here is it's saying, listen, there's one thing if there's wheat in a field and a person or people can traverse through and damage it, but if there's nothing to loss, uh, there's no loss to achieve because there's been harvested, what what damage does it cause you if somebody uh, goes through your field? It's almost a case where we learned in Bhavakama before where um, uh, somebody sleeps... Uh, a vagrant sleeps, a Jewish vagrant sleeps in your barn. Now, uh, does he have to pay back the uh, owner? And the, the, the Duff came out and said that, look, if the person was renting a room and took it under the premise that he was going to pay rent and absconded, he's legally liable. Or he took space away from somebody that was going to pay. But if the person wasn't going to pay, because nobody's going to sleep in a barn with chickens and geese and all sorts of, and horses, and you sleep in there, since you weren't going to lose any money from it, why don't you have the person staying there? It didn't cost you money. You've given the Jew a shelter. So don't be punitive. That's what it's saying. So in other words, when you can benefit others without it costing you, uh, you've got no rights to refuse to do so. Okay? So the Gemara asks in astonishment, but hang on a second, there might be cases where we can see to the contrary. Because it's written anywhere, when can, uh, so, so it's saying, look, I understand like you've got this thing with Rav Hila that stood on one leg and said, what is harmful to others, do not do, uh, what, is, what, what is harmful to you, do not do for others. Unfortunately, in the New Testament, they corrupted that and they said J.C. Penny, who was a thief, stole it and said, what you, what you want done to you, do to others, which is a stupid expression if you analyze it. Because if I like crumpets and I don't like strawberries and I give you crumpets and you've got a, a gluten allergy or you've got a lactose allergy, you're going to land up in hospital. What do you mean if it's good for me, it's good for you? Not necessarily. But the converse is true. If it's damaging to me, most likely it'll be damaging to you. If Since I don't like to consume arsenic, I'm assuming that you don't either. Okay, you can always err on the side of caution. And therefore, what is disdainful to you, do not do to others, is a general rule. You don't want to be stolen from, don't steal. You don't want somebody to fiddle with your wife, don't fiddle with theirs. You know, that's my bark, that's my wife, don't touch it, etc. We get it. I don't want to be tonked and killed, don't kill me. So it's a quid pro quo that societies have set up the Noah hard laws in order to create a system of reciprocity of what is disdainful to you, do not do to others. So it says, okay, so that's, we understand Rav Hillel, uh, but it says like, you can't really find a verse in scripture that says, when can you be good? Do not be called bad. There's no such verse. So the Gemara explains, yes, okay. It's not really written in that same sort of uh, uh, manner, but if you have a look, uh, there's this idea in Proverbs chapter three, verse 27, which was written by King Shlomo, the wisest of all men, King Solomon. And it says, in essence, that a farmer may not deny the public a shortcut through his fields when they are barren. So what it's saying is you can deduce from this that um, uh, generally anything that's going to not harm anybody, you shouldn't do. Um, now, uh, there's, it's interesting... Um, let me just put it in a simple way. So the Maharsha asked something interesting. He said, um, can a farmer in our case be forced to allow shortcuts through his barren field? The answer is that even though this particular courtyard is not for rent, courtyards are commonly rented. Hence, the owner is not considered a bad person if he decides to adopt the prevailing practice. On the other hand, allowing passage through barren fields is the prevailing custom. And one who contravenes it is guilty of withholding good from others. So it was saying, if that's a common custom of courtesy, that also plays a role of what's considered usual within the context of that culture. Um, so, for example, uh, if you go, um, just waiting for Gavin. Gavin? Gav? Damon? You said if a, a property is damaged on the field, it should leave the field. 
Yeah. Gabba, are, are you with us now? All right. Thank God my self-esteem is intact. Damon, right. and yep. you were saying if they, if somebody didn't want to, if they wanted to really be nasty to, to like a, a Jewish vagrant sleeping in the barn and kick them out, that would be, that would be the last straw. Very funny. I, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> loving this. Uh, I'm loving this. Um, all right. Um, so let's just uh, take this a little bit seriously. Um, so, guys, the Meiri writes that uh, uh, Solomon's regulation comes specifically to include the period between sowing and the second autumn rainfall, because it was necessary to instruct that during this time, the treading of the public would not harm the new seeds. So there is a period where it's not appropriate. However, there's no regulation that was needed for uh, the period uh, between basically harvesting and sowing. Because between harvesting and sowing new seeds, there's no damage that you can obviously cause. So there, there it's a non-issue. So the Gemara now contends that Yeshua uh, stipulated, um, well, before we get to that, the, the bottom line is that it's written in the following manner, that do not withhold good from its rightful recipients when you have the power to do it. In other words, that's what you learn from the uh, Proverbs, uh, chapter 3, verse 27, by King uh, uh, Solomon. Um, now, in essence, here, yeah, the case is that a farmer cannot deny the public a shortcut through his fields when they're barren because there's no risk to him. So the Gemara is going to contend with another issue. And it says, look, they stipulated more than 10 conditions reported in the Brysa. And there are no more conditions stipulated by Joshua and when he divided the land, but there is a condition that Rav Yehuda reported, as was taught in Abraisa. Rav Yehuda says, at the time of taking out the stable and the barnyard refuse, uh, which is the uh, byproduct of the animal, uh, and I'm not refusing to teach you, hey, Kevin, that's here, yeah. Okay. It's like, by the way, guys, uh, I, I, my dad told me when I was older it was called a minute steak because it takes a minute to cook. I always thought it was called a minute steak because it was time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just saying, I don't like the one thing in English where uh, an invalid, somebody that's crippled, is known as invalid, where they don't count. Yeah, I don't like that. Just on a, on a separate note, going off on a tangent. So right. Rav Yehuda made a stipulation because we're saying right. We've explained that the one addition from the ten was actually by King Solomon. So Joshua is only given over 10, even though it's stated 11. The one was from King Solomon. There is another condition by Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda says, at the time of taking out the stable and barn rod refuse, a person may take his refuse out to the public domain and heap it there for an entire 30 days so that it will be crushed by the feet of people and animals walking on the road. For on this condition, Joshua gave the Israelites possession of the land. So what are we talking about here is that there were certain times of the year when it was customary uh, to fertilize the fields. Now, farmers had to clear the refuse out of their stables and barnyards and deposit it in the road because, and they could leave it there up to 30 days. Because what happens is when people continually crush it, it con uh, converts the refuse into manure, rendering it fit for use of fertilizer. So Rabbi Cohen described it as um, basically releasing the chemicals and allowing the heat and the sun and treading to be able to bring out the nutritional value of the compost and manure from waste product. That's all it was. So you've only got 30 days for it up to do it in. And um, obviously at certain times of the year, because um, you need that uh, when it's not rainy season, otherwise it's not going to be a joy for anybody walking on there. Um, now, on this condition, Joshua gave the Israelites possession of the land. So it's saying if he gave possession of the land based on this, it's an 11th condition stipulated by Joshua because it's endorsed by Joshua. So why is this not, uh, does our price... Uh, uh, list actually only 10. So 
Look, the Gomorrah points out three other regulations from Joshua, and it's going to make sense now. There are the conditions that Rabbi Yishmael, the son of Rav Yochanan ben Baroka, reported. As it was taught in the Brisa, Rav Yishmael, the son of Rav Yochanan ben Baroka, said, it's a stipulation of the court that this beekeeper shall be allowed to go down in his fellow's field and cut off the bough of his fellow's tree in order to save his swarm of bees that flew into the neighbor's field and settled on that bough. So before we talk about bees and sticks and boughs and things learned, and things like that, what I'm saying is, is that you could turn around and say Yeshua comes after Joshua. Uh, not Joshua as in um, Yeshua, the first Joshua, but Yesh, uh, Yeshua the Amoira, which it's going to bring up. But it's saying if Yeshua endorsed it, then it should be part of, uh, added to his 10. It shouldn't be included where it's ignored and uh, it's just an 11th one when our brass are only list 10. So we're going to come to this. But we're now talking about this other enactment from Rav Yishma, the son of Rav Yochanan ben Baraka. So what's this issue with bees? Is that basically bees prefer the bough of a tree to the beehive. Because they would fly away and be lost if their beekeeper uh, attempted to pluck them off the bough one by one. So the only way to recover the swarm is to cut off the entire bough. So what does this mean? is that Rabbi Cohen explained it that there's the queen bee and they all follow the queen bee. And what happens is when they follow the queen bee onto a stick, Gav, you on your phone, is anybody with me today? I can't hear you, muted. I'm Who's following, following the queen bee on the stick, Damon? Who's it talking about? Who you said they? Who's Hang on, they? Gavin, Gavin, what did you say, buddy? I'll come back to you now. I'm not on any phone. I don't know why okay. you say I'm on the phone. Okay, no, because I saw you bend down and like busy with stuff. No, no, no. I was looking at something. I'm not on any phone whatsoever. All right, you're looking at source, Talmudic sourcing. <laughs> calculator. Sources. Maybe it's good. Gavin, you got a calculator in front of you. A shop. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a calculator. <laughs> I'm not distracted. I'm complete. Yes, I've, I've, I've got a sharp calculator. Yeah. Uh, right. let's, let's continue, guys. Sorry. I'm Damon, not on you phone. said they. Talking about the they. Who's the they? Talking about, okay. talking about the bees. So, what we're Who's... saying is they is in plural of farmers. Basically, oh, okay. you need uh, bees because bees are involved with pollination of uh, uh, different plants. And bees were used to uh, make honey, they were an asset. You know, not everybody's like me that you go to bees and it's going to end up being a liability. Most people that know how to handle bees are an asset. That's not me. So what happens is if your bees escape and they go into your neighbor's stick, it's almost a bow. In other words, they congregate because there's some sort of material to attract the queen bee or the other bees will follow. Now, generally, Kevin, you're not allowed to break off a stick of somebody else's um, produce. Um, if they're going to use it for firewood or it's some something of benefit to the neighbor, you can't just take it part of his property. But if all those bees congregate on a stick, you're entitled to take it back even if you break that stick. And the reason being is because your bees are worth more than the stick of the neighbor. You might have to reimburse him, <clears throat> Rabbi Cohen said, for the value of his particular produce. Like you take a case of wine. Now, say honey. Honey is worth more than one, cheap one. So what happens is if I see my containers leaking of honey and it's about to collapse, then <clears throat> and you give me your thing of wine and you throw it out in order to collect my honey. You don't have to make a statement with me, will you accept the cost of my wine? Because Rabbi Cohen said it's implicit and if you're throwing away a cheaper product in order to do me the favor of saving my more expensive product, I have to pay you for your cheaper product because I would either lose money hand over foot. <coughs> so therefore, you don't need a declaration from the person you're doing a favor for. It's obvious. So what we're saying is here that the beekeeper shall be allowed to go down into his fellow's field and cut off the stick of his fellow's tree in order to save a swarm of bees that flew into the neighbor's field and set it on that, uh, it's called a bough. Let's just call it a, a branch or whatever you want to call it, just so you guys understand. 
And basically, the beekeeper must give him compensation for the value of his fellow's produce. In other words, wherever the bees landed and he needed to break off that portion in order to get the queen bee back with all the bees, he has to reimburse his neighbor for the value of whatever he took off. But he doesn't have to ask permission. And it's another stipulation of the court that this person coming along with a barrel of wine shall be required to pour out his wine and save the empty barrel of his fellow's honey. Okay, we don't mean his fellow's honey is in his fellow's wife. Okay, just to clear that yeah. up for you, Kev. So what we're right. saying is here, the case, the case is basically just... You, you know what? I must put my stuff on aeroplane mode so, because every flipping idiot is phoning me. Damon, so so even though it's it's a, the, the beekeeper went and he tore a branch off a tree just to for for, for safety to, for, for, to 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 get to get the, the queen bee and, and the rest of the the, the not the for safety bees. to save him money. He wants his he wants his bees back. Oh, okay. So, okay. So it wasn't for safety that it. No, I said. Uh, I said for me, these are a liability because if I get stung, I'm dead. For these guys, it was an asset because it was used for pollination. Oh, so the bees were in someone else's pro property. I'm saying they they were, the they were they were in his half, and for some reason the queen bee left, and all the bees followed and we're went in to the tree. neighbor's property, and they landed on the neighbor's fig tree, for example. So he wants to get his bees back because they're worth a lot of money. Uh, it's it's used to promulgate different plant species, etc. So he breaks it off, takes it. So he has to replace what he took off from his neighbor, yeah, okay. but he doesn't have to ask permission. And we're saying here it's the same thing when uh, his neighbor sees that he's got uh, honey and he throws away his wine in order to save his neighbor's honey, right? Um, so the owner of the barrel of wine can count on another Jew coming along with a barrel of honey. This is according to Rashi. When, they, uh, when the barrel of honey split. So the court stipulated that the owner of the honey, which is more valuable than wine, may compel the other fellow to spill out his wine in order to collect the honey in the intact barrel. Okay, But the owner of the wine acted on his own initiative to save the honey. And therefore... Uh, the question arises, since he acted out of his own initiative, do you have to replace the one or not? That's actually the discussion that's there. And the Gemara says, and as a compensation, he may take the amount equivalent to the value of his sp uh, spilt wine from his fellow's honey. Uh, so all we are saying there is he only, he only did this to help his friend, and it was the gentlemanly thing to do. But you can't expect when somebody's a gentleman and saves your uh, your uh, your ability to lose a substantial amount of money that you should be so crass as to not pay them back for the wine. At the end of the day, um, you've got to recompensate them for the wine because you still saved money. Because what you lose in the honey was worth far more than the wine that you paid out. So Tosford and Rashba explain that the Bryce speaks of where there's a barrel of honey and it was wrapped with a bale from a pressing house. And in such a case, the honey was just leaking out through the wrapping and it remained private property because it could, uh, be, uh, because it could be saved. So had there been no wrapping and the honey was gushing out, it would be considered lost to its owner and therefore legally abandoned. So under those circumstances, the owner of the wine could claim that he inquired the entire quantity of honey by receiving it in the barrel. So let's just forget about that argument and just keep it uh, uh, quite straightforward as Rabbi Cohen did and said, listen, this is a case where if somebody saved your honey by throwing out cheaper wine in comparison to the honey, pay them back uh, for the wine. You don't have, and if, if the owner of the honey said, no, we never explicitly agreed, the courts say it's implicit that you agreed because why would somebody throw out their wine and why would you not stop them unless there was an arrangement on your side to save you a more expensive product? So let's just keep it simple without going to the Rashba and Tosfot because Rabbi Khan is good at keeping it simple. Okay. So there's another stipulation of the court that this person with a bundle of wood on his donkey shall be required to unload his wood and load his fellow's flax on the donkey. So again, we're seeing the same principle. Because in this case, a person transport, um, transporting yeah, a bundle of wood on his donkey 
is less expensive than someone who's transporting a bundle of flax on his donkey. Okay? And we're saying that, listen, the one who was, uh, and the second donkey basically died. That's what happened. So, so you know, if a donkey died, how is he going to take uh, the flax? He's going to take some flax, but not the flax. How is that, Kevin? You like? So this, yeah, yeah, very good. Then you're informed, but so does this get, so they're saying honey was produced and there was wine that was with the honey and, and no, uh, no, no, that no, belonged no, 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 to, no. Just, just go over that again. Okay, sure. This, the case of the wine, the case of the wood and the flax is the same as the honey and the wine. Kevin, it's you and me. Now you've got a barrel of wine and I've got a barrel of honey. Okay. Now my barrel of honey is worth 10,000 shekels. Your barrel of wine is worth 2,000 shekels. So I can say to you, throw out your wine, and I'm going to put my honey into your barrel. And you do so. Okay? And I, you save my honey. Uh, okay? And you save my honey. How's that? I'm on top form tonight for you, Kev. So, um, uh, tiny is another word for tochus, in case you don't know. So, um so what 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 we're saying is I come to court and and you turn around and you say you owe me for the wine. I say to you, you know what wine you offer to do it. The court is gonna say nonsense. And I and I will turn around to the court and say, No, 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 but Kevin and I didn't come to any arrangement. The court will say nonsense. You could have lost ten thousand rand. Kevin lost two thousand rand to help you because the right thing to do was for him to have virtue and um that sort of loss. So you uh, pay him the 2,000 because at the end of the day, you still saved 8,000 Rand when you would have lost 10,000 Rand. So therefore, I have to pay you back, Kevin, whether we agreed or not, because you saved me. And the difference of yes. your wine is cheaper than my honey. You did me a favor. Therefore, I'll pay you back whether we agreed on it or not. Because someone's going to making a loss of 2,000. Yes. Yeah. Number, a loss of 8,000. The honey's worth 10,000. Your wine is worth 2000 Oh, they threw the wine out. Oh, okay, okay. So you threw the wine out in order to save my honey. Okay? So what uh, So what happened is you say to me, Day, I'd like the 2000 back for the wine. I said, what are you talking about? Uh, I said, you did me a favor. You said, no, why, why would I take a loss of 2000 And I said, but we didn't agree, and you take me to court. You would win. Because it could be proved that you're not suicidal. You're not going to use... Lose 2,000 Rand for nothing. You saved me 8,000 Rand because I would have lost 10,000 Rand, but I must pay you the 2,000 for your wine. I don't pay you nothing for the wine. So I, I was going to lose 10 grand, now I'm only losing two to recompensate you for the wine. I'm still making 8,000 Rand, and I would have lost all 10 grand if it hadn't been for you. The court says I must pay you back whether I agreed to it or not at the time. Otherwise, I should have stopped you and said, don't throw it away. I'm not prepared to reimburse you. Nobody's going to say that. So by logic, it proves that Kevin's right. By logic. Now, it's saying the same thing with flax and wood. There's two donkeys. Okay? The first donkey is wood. The second donkey is flax. The second donkey drops dead. Now, if I don't get that flax to delivery, I'm going to lose that flax. And get flack for it, Kevin, as you said. So, so what would happen then is that you agree to take the loss of your wood in order that I put on the flax. But then when it comes to court and, and you say to me, but you need to owe me for the wood, I'll say to you, no, you agreed to do it. Same as the honey. The court says I have to pay you for your loss because I still come out better out uh, as a result of you helping me. That's the bottom line. So if I wasn't prepared to pay for your wood, I should have stopped you. What must I expect you to pay for the wood for of that loss? You did me a huge favor. So that was the second case. And as compensation, he may take an amount <coughs> to the value of his abandoned wood from his fellow's flax. For with all these types of stipulations, Joshua gave the Israelites possession of the land. In other words, uh, those are stipulations of the court, and they attributed to Joshua and the high court operates in the post-Joshua era. But uh, Joshua did, in fact, author those regulations. And the judges were guided by examples of Joshua's stipulations. And for that reason, the Bryce attributed them 
to Yeshua, and apparently the connection to Joshua was sufficient cause for the Gemara to question the accuracy of Abras's figures. So what the Parisha is basically saying in Choshen Mishpat is, well, why don't we say that Joshua said 13 things? Why did he say 10 things? Because now we're questioning Joshua that did he say the other things and the truth of it is he did, because that's how we based the law afterwards in Israel, because of his high court enactments. So then why does it just say three other things? Um, so why does the Bryce list only 10? So we don't speak of individual opinions. That's the answer that Gomorrah gives, meaning that if the Bryce specifies 10 stipulations, in an anonymous tonight teaching, and it reflects the majority opinion, the other four stipulations were reported by individual Tanoim, Rav Yehud and Rav Yishmael, etc., explain that since the four additional stipulations, all guys have a common theme. And what's the common theme? Is that if one faces a greater loss and somebody else suffers a lesser loss, then you owe it to the person to help them, but they have to compensate you for your lesser loss because they're still coming off better off. And it's, it's, it's the same sort of concept of if it doesn't cost you any money and you can help somebody, why not? And that falls under one category. Therefore, you don't have to list it as other categories of Joshua, even though in their application, there are other categories because it comes under the same concept in the Shulchan Aruch. Do you, get, do you get what I'm saying, guys? Okay. So, um, so the Gemara uh, persists in its challenge, noting another stipulation made by Joshua. In other words, this was a uh, this is reported by a different person in the Moira, Rav Yochanan. And the Gemara is challenging the Moira from the Brysa. Okay. So when Rav Avim came to Babylonia from Eretz Israel, he said in the name of Rav Yochanan, Regarding both the tree whose branches extend into his fellow's fields and a tree that is adjacent, in other words, within 16 amos of a neighbor's boundary, the owner of the tree brings Bikurim from the tree's fruits and recites the appropriate verses. So what we are saying is the roots of the tree are actually drawing nutrients from the earth within the radius of 16 amos from the trunk. So in Rav Yochanan's case, the roots... The, the roots of the tree are actually softening nutrients from the neighbor's property because the, the roots um, are going to take nutrition away. They're not just short roots, they're deep roots. So the exact case of the tree's branches extends into his fam, uh, fellow's field, etc. That's in Bava Metzir in the 107th Duff in Aleph. So basically in the Chumash, in Shemot, Exodus chapter 23, verse 19, and uh, chapter 34, verse 26, and separately in Deuteronomy, chapter 26, verse 1 to 11, there's a commandment to the farmers in Eretz Israel to take the first ripened fruits, the, uh, the, the Bikurim, Bikuri, okay, from the seven species for which the land is praised, okay, so those, what do you call it? What do you call it, Kevin? What? Uh, Arba meaning by the... Uh... That's the support. That's a little bit. Yeah, yeah, not the Arba Mimi. What do you call those seven special fruits and uh, stuff from uh, Israel? Ah, yes. We well, have to do a Rona run afterwards if you consume them, like dates, figs. Yes, uh, yes. So wheat, that. Uh, correct. Spells. So any of those uh, form, um, you'd have to do Bikurim. You have to get the first ripened fruits uh, and bring uh, present them to the Kohen. And you have to do the Holy Temple pilgrimage in Jerusalem. So it's a declaration to the gratitude of Hashem. Okay? Tithing. Tithing um, of those. Yeah, it's a tithing of those. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, tithing is more Misa, but you certainly uh, ha have to give them. It's separate to Misa, yeah. So basically, what happens is you're taking from your neighbor's nutrient. So that's a bit of a problem for... So with the stipulation Joshua gave the Israelites in terms of possession of the land. So what are we talking about here? In Baba Basra in the 26th Duff, Ulla states that one who planted a tree within 16 amos of his fellow's property is stealing the nutrients from the other person's land. And he doesn't bring Pukurim from that tree because you can't uh, take fruit that's from theft, basically. It's got to be from your land. 
you can't do a mitzvah with an avera, okay? So uh, pers- Rav Yochanan states, pursuant to Joshua's enactment, not only is the tree owner not a thief, but the nutrients of the other person's field can be called your land. And so the tree owner brings Bikurim. So we're saying you would have thought that you couldn't because you're stealing the nutrition from his land. But you, it's not so. Because you shall take the first fruits from your land. These fruits are still considered from your land because the farmer must declare, I've brought the first fruits of the ground that you have given me. In other words, where did it sprout? It actually sprouted in his premises. But uh, Bikurim are not, uh, but, but according to Ula, Bikurim are, are not brought because it's basically a, 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 a gray area. Okay? So um, all, all we are saying is, so see, we've got some time. Okay. Um, so uh, so the, we want to say if this is a stipulation that, in fact, it can bring the Bukurin, apart from Ulla's opinion, and it's not sapping the nutrition, um, then is that a living condition by Joshua? Why does the Brysa list only 10? So in truth, the list of stipulations isn't presented in the Brysa. Who taught the 10 conditions that Joshua stipulated? Is Rav Yeshua ben Levi and the Muira. Which basically means that the Gemara answers that the Brysa recorded is just a statement of Rav Yeshua ben Levi, who was simply enumerating the stipulations. He didn't expressly mention the Tanaim and each and every facet. And Rav Yeshua ben Levi was arguing with his fellow Moira, Rav Yochanan, regarding whether Joshua ever issued a condition involving Bikurim. So what it's saying is, this is the list according to Rav Yeshua ben Levi, and he's saying that uh, Joshua didn't actually give the stipulation involving involving Bikurim, and Rav Yochanan is saying that he did. So therefore, Rav Yeshua ben Levi only has 10 in his list. Okay? So we here, here we can see that it's just the... Uh, a Moiric dictum of Rav Yeshua ben Levi. It doesn't mean there's not another one because there is other opinions. Um, okay, guys, I thought uh, we, we covered a lot of ground today. It was clear. Covered about three pages. I don't know what you guys think. Is it still page uh, uh, Duff 81? No, so we have hit, hit the 82nd Duff. We're flying, guys. Flying. Okay, okay. Can't hear you, Gav. What were you going to say, Bitty? Just unmute yourself, Arthur. Yeah, sorry, my my mistake. Um, yeah, yeah, we're going at a much better pace, but it's 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 definitely a little bit uh, um, easier than some of the stuff we've done in the yeah, podcast. exactly. That's why exactly. It's not. It's nowhere near as complicated. Eh? It's I, quite, I agree. It's reasonably straightforward. Eh? I mean, there's a couple of things here and there, but nothing like uh, that's fine. What, yeah, that's... what we've been doing up until yeah. now, we've done some some really tricky stuff. This is this is quite straightforward. Thanks, though. Well, but it's yeah. still good. It's, good. it's mm. good that we're catching up, pace. Though. Yeah, I must say, um, I've gone through. I'm I'm ready on the thirty third from the second to the thirty third already, Amazing. and the refresher thing actually really helped me a lot. Amazing. Yeah, I'm on the part where they're talking about the in the the guy who comes into the, the guy's shop, with or without permission, going into the forest, whether it's a shared domain or a public, etc. Very interesting to have that recap in your head. Yeah, it is. And you know what? I always, uh, always, as a rule, if you're going into a workshop and somebody's busy with axes and equipment, you don't stealthily go in the shop. You find him on his cell phone and you say, can I come in? Or before the cell phone, say, hello. I don't want to walk so, in and get myself tonked. Damon, 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 as long as he doesn't have really an axe to grind with you, Damon. Damon, if you and I go into a shop, you go first. You're the king. <laughs> <laughs> now you are the king, Arthur. You're the king, Arthur.